כן. Okay, um, my name is Will Moy. I'm one of the organizing committee. Um, it's my great pleasure to present three uh, brilliant speakers and panelists um, over the next hour. The first of whom is Kate Starbird from the University of Washington. So I'll hand over to her. Thank you, and I am going to jump into this talk because it's a 30-minute talk shoved into 20 minutes. All right, um, I'm going to start out with my goals for this talk. I'm going to try to help you understand what disinformation is and how it works. Um, I'm going to situate the term in some historical context, provide some recent cases of online disinformation, and use those to correct some misperceptions and perhaps add some nuance to that understanding. And number four is a goal, we'll see if I can achieve it, uh, and that's to, let, to end on a less hopeless note. Um, I've been giving some depressing talks over the last two years, and I'm trying to bring that up a little bit. Um, the first thing I want to do is distinguish between misinformation and disinformation. The differences between the two are especially important when we start to think about solutions. One high-level way to characterize a distinction is simply as a matter of intent. Misinformation is information that is false, but not necessarily deliberately so, while disinformation is intentionally false information. But in another view, disinformation isn't simply about intent. The term has other more specific meanings as a historical context. It has been used to describe a particular kind of political propaganda, and it's been connected to this term, desinformatia, originating in Soviet intelligence. Our understanding of disinformation is informed by Bittman, who was a practitioner of Soviet disinformation, a member of Czech intelligence. He defected the United States in 1968 and then became a professor of disinformation. And a lot of what we know is from him about the history of disinformation, how it was used in the past. Borrowing from Bittman, we define disinformation as a suite of tactics applied by influence agents to manipulate information spaces to achieve specific strategic political objectives. It's important to note that not all disinformation, historical or modern, uh, is connected to Russia. It's really important to note that right now. But they have been innovators in the space, and we should appreciate them for that. Um, and I'm going to present two case studies of recent online disinformation, both that are con connected to Russia's intelligence and influence apparatus. These are long-term studies that took place over the course of multiple years in our lab. They're, our methods are profoundly mixed. We conduct iterative, qualitative, and quantitative interpretive analysis of social media data and other online content. To some extent, both are cross-platform studies, even though the seed data for both studies is Twitter data, which is something that maybe we can talk about later at the panel. The first case study is of R Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. election. But we didn't actually set out to stu study disinformation in this case. Actually, initially, we were studying framing contests in the Black Lives Matter discourse, between, uh, primarily between Black Lives Matter activists who were advocating against systemic injustice and a counter-movement of conservative accounts that attempted to challenge and, denigrated, and denigrate the Black Lives Matter message. This conversation was highly polarized. From data collected related to shooting events in 2016, we generated a data set of tweets that had either Black Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter in the text. We then created a structural graph of retweets in that data set. In this graph, each little circle or node is an account, and those accounts are actually clustered closer together if they retweeted each other and further apart if they didn't. So edges are retweets even though the edges currently aren't visible in this graph. The graph revealed two separate communities or echo chambers on either side of this conversation. There was pro-Black Lives Matter on the left, these were accounts that were also politically left in most cases, and anti-Black Lives Matter on the right, and these accounts were politically right in most cases. The two sides created and spread very different frames about police shootings of African American citizens. We completed this study in 2017, um, we published it, we gave a, a nice little talk about it, and then a few weeks later in November 2017, Twitter released a list of accounts they had found to be associated with Russia's internet research agency. Um, and at the time, that agency was, we now know was running disinformation operations online during 2016 and for several years prior, targeting U.S. populations. So when Twitter released that list, I went online, I looked at the list, and I said, holy moly, I recognize some of those accounts. They had been in our, in our data prior. In fact, we had used some of those accounts in examples in our paper, in, in the excerpts. Um, and so after featuring them, so we decided as a group that we would cross-reference Twitter's list that they had given us with this graph to see where the IRA agents were. 
in that conversation. So the troll accounts here are mapped in orange, and retweets of those accounts, I, I'm now showing them as edges in orange in the graph. And you can see this graph reveals Russian information operators or disinformation agents were active on both sides of the Black Lives Matter conversation. A few were among the most influential accounts in that conversation. An orange account on the left was retweeted, was retweeted by Jack at Twitter and me. Several accounts on the right had integrated into other grassroots online organizing efforts on the conservative side, perhaps through follow-back mechanisms. Many of those accounts were following the IRA accounts. So my PhD student, Emmer Arif, conducted in-depth qualitative research on the accounts in orange. He found that the IRA accounts enacted multi-dimensional online uh, personas across platforms that played on stereotypes of African Americans on one side and white US conservatives on the other. They were impersonating activists and also modeling for others what online activism looked like, reflecting norms, but also to some extent shaping them. Often their content wasn't superficially problematic or any different from what others in the space were sharing. They were tweeting about strong black voices on the left or support for US veterans on the right. They were cultivating audiences for future strategic messaging. In other places, they were sowing and amplifying division. Some of their content was among the most vitriolic in the space, advocating for violence against police on the left and using racial epithets on the right. In a few places, we can actually see them holding arguments with themselves, like a puppeteer, one of their accounts on the left having a fight with one of their accounts on the right. So stepping back, what we were actually seeing here was a multi-year, it was a snapshot of a multi-year campaign to infiltrate and shape political discourse in the United States, orchestrated by a group with ties to the Russian government. We can see them burrowing into and working within organic online communities. The second case is slightly different. This case looks at disinformation during armed conflict. In this case, uh, the uh, civil war in Syria, and we've been studying that uh, discourse since about 2017. In particular, in this research, we focus on discourse surrounding the work of the Syria Civil Defense, also known as the White Helmets, a volunteer response group that works in rebel-held areas of Syria. This, search, this group does search and rescue and provides medical aid to people impacted by the civil war there. The White Helmets also document these impacts. In the case here, they're specifically calling out the, Syria, the Syrian government's Russian allies and claiming that they specifically target aid workers. They've also documented um, impacts from chemical weapon attacks and uh, impacts from, from uh, Russian bombs from planes. The White Helmet's content has served to some extent to draw attention to, to the cause of the people on the ground in Syria, to garner solidarity with and sympathy for the Syrian people, um, especially those in this case that were living in rebel-held areas as opposed to those living in areas that were controlled by the regime. In 2017 and 2018, when we started studying this conversation, if you search Twitter or Google for white helmets, you may have found some tweets supporting them. But most likely you would have encountered content like this, content that challenges the white helmets, claiming that they are a propaganda construct of the West, equating them with terrorists, and calling them crisis actors. In our research in this conversation, we again began with a collection of tweets, in this case, tweets that contained white helmets. And this is one representation of that data set. It's got a couple of things going on. In the center of this graph is a retweet network graph of that conversation. Again, similar to the, the structural property we used before. Nodes are accounts. They're sized by the number of retweets they, they receive. So the, more, the larger accounts are the more influential ones. And nodes are connected with edges when one account retweets another. We look, uh, using a community detection algorithm, we identified two major clusters of accounts in this conversation. We dove into the content, and you can find that, that one is pro-white helmets, that's in blue. Um, and the other is anti-white helmets, and that's in pink or red on the right side of the graph. As you can see, the red cluster is dominating this conversation. Their activity is persistent over time. Many of the accounts repeatedly tweeting and retweeting content that specifically attacks the white helmets. They are literally drowning out the voices of the accounts on the other side. We heard about data voids yesterday. This is content that's strategically filled or is filling a, a data void. So who are these accounts on the right that are dominating the conversation? Top influencers include self-described journalists, which are most of the accounts you can see there. I normally wouldn't put the name of an account in a conversation like this, but these are people that are very vocal about their position and their activity. Um, there are also officials from the Syrian government and others. 
And there are a few of what seem to be inauthentic and likely paid or organizationally controlled troll accounts. But inauthentic troll accounts make up only a tiny percentage of this conversation. And though we looked for them, we did not find that bots were contributing in any significant way. Most of the accounts in red are unaffiliated accounts who identify as activists. Many have been active in other political conversations. A large, trunk, uh, sorry, a large chunk have tweeted pro-Palestinian content. Many also identify as anti-imperialist and anti-war. Um, a lot of their accounts portrayed uh, political identities that actually aligned with people in our research group, which made this content really hard for them to uh, work through. So these are real people. They're sincere believers of the content that they're sharing. And what are they doing? They're participating in very much in what looks like online organizing or online activism. They share articles and videos that support their narratives. They mention each other a lot. They whistle and then collectively dogpile content that supports the white helmets. I've experienced that. They are persistent. They tweet about the white helmets for months and in some cases years. They activate at opportune times to capitalize um, on new information that helps them make their case and then to distract from, some, from breaking news events that may not portray the Syrian government or the Ru Russian government in ways that they, that they appreciate. So they bring up old content to bury new events that are, that are not um, supportive of their narratives. So I want to show you one other structure pro structural property of this, this graph because it makes one final point here. So around the outside of this graph are a different kind of node. These are web domains or websites that are linked to from the tweets shared by accounts in the center of the graph. So these domains are sized relative to the number of tweets we had in our data set that linked to that domain. And they're colored according to the proportion of tweets coming from the red and blue sides of the graph. So, so uh, domains that are pink are mostly shared by accounts on the pink side. And purple ones are kind of shared by both equally. And blue domains are mostly shared by the ones on the left. So I want to focus in on this one. So we see YouTube up there. I, I have another study about that. I don't have time to talk about it today. Um, it was a primary resource mostly for the, the uh, activists on the, on the right side of the graph. But if we look closer in on this one section, we see that two of the top domains that support this conversation are RT, formerly Russia Today, and Sputnik News. Both domains are part of the Russian government's media and influence apparatus. In the White Helmets conversation, these news domains provide content, including video content of the conflict, and interviews with voices that share their objectives. They shape narratives. They amplify the voices of anti-white helmets influencers. They repeatedly interview the journalists who are among the top, the most retweeted in this conversation. And often these journalists link back to their interviews on RT, demonstrating this kind of cross-promotion. There are other accounts here in pink, or so there are other domains here in pink that function as a kind of gray propaganda. I sadly don't have time to show that, but I have, we have other research on that if you're interested. So stepping back on this one, this is a persistent campaign of at least partially organic political activism, supported by the Russian government's media apparatus, and in alignment or shaped to align to their strategic objectives. So I want to use some of this material from those studies to revisit our, under, our understanding of disinformation. I want to share a couple of things uh, that we've learned about what it is, how it works, why we're vulnerable, and why solutions aren't so simple. Disinformation is not simply false information, and sometimes it isn't false at all. To be effective, disinformation layers truth with lies, often building on a true or plausible core, but then adding new details and omitting others to shape a specific narrative towards a st specific strategic objective. In the IRA troll case, the troll accounts misled their audiences about who they were and what their intentions or motivations were. They attempted to shape political discourse and political action, in this case voting, of the communities they infiltrated towards objectives that they, those communities were not aware of and likely didn't share. In the White Helmets case, we can see narratives like this one, built from factual information that the White Helmets and others um, provide about the funding they receive from Western governments, and evidence such as the videos the White Helmets produced themselves. And they use, that ev they use this material to claim that they are therefore a propaganda construct of the West. According to the activists in pink, in the media that support them. The White Helmets are paid by Western governments to create propaganda meant to change how people see the war. It's a compelling narrative that's hard to problematize as simply false or simply true. It's strategic. Another insight from this work is that we need to consider or reconsider our unit of analysis. It's not always effective to think of disinformation as a single piece of information, but instead to think of it as a campaign. 
Bittman uses this use, unit of analysis talking about disinformation as an information operation or campaign. Borrowing from his characterization and our analysis of modern disinformation, we agree that it's useful to think of disinformation not as a quality of a specific piece of information, but as a collection of information actions or a campaign. Looking at the 2016 election interference in the U.S., we can see a multi-channel, multi-dimensional campaign. On the IRA side, we talk about Twitter, but the troll activity was multi-platform. It was on Facebook, it was on Instagram, there was, they were commenting on web articles and in forums. They were making and distributing playlists on SoundCloud, um, but it wasn't just a social media campaign or even just the IRA and its trolls. It included the release of stolen emails that have re repeatedly been associated with Russian hackers. It in it included the use of great propaganda sites to push their narratives, the manipulation of mainstream media to spread their stolen content, and the infiltration of other social and political organizations. It's not one thing, it's a campaign. In the White Helmets example, it's not just a single piece of information, or even a single narrative, but it's an onslaught of stories that built into several connected narratives, using Twitter and YouTube and in combination with connected media strategies across dozens of gray propaganda sites, this effort sought to undermine the White Helmets, especially in their efforts to garner sympathy from global audiences, but also to connect them to terrorists on one hand and narratives questioning intervention, Western intervention and challenging Western media on the other. I end with one of their more recent narratives, a tweet featuring an RT interview with, prominent, with a prominent journalist in this space, where she claims that the white helmets are trafficking in the organs of children. And I'm going to leave that one there. Considering these two together, as we turn to questions of detection, which is an important area of research, especially in online environments, this means that identifying disinformation isn't about determining the truth value of a single post or the authenticity of a single account but to think about how that post and account fit into a larger campaign where the underlying intent is to mislead for a strategic political purpose. In this view, disinformation re remains disinformation regardless of who the intermediary is. A person does not need to be aware of their role in a campaign to be a participant. This gets to the point that we highlighted in the title of the talk. A lot of research in this area has focused on detecting automated activity or bots and looking at inauthentic, troll, or inauthentic accounts or trolls. But disinformation isn't just about bots and trolls. As we can see in our study, it targets, infiltrates, cultivates, shapes, and ultimately leverages online crowds and communities. Bittman talked about the role that unwitting agents played in historical disinformation campaigns. Here we can see agents working with, collaborating with, unwitting crowds to achieve their goals. I encourage researchers and platform designers not just to focus on the orange parts of the graph on the left, but to look at the blue and the pink in the graph on the right to, show, to study how online communities are targeted and affected by disinformation, how some members of those unwitting crowds take it up and make it their own, eventually generated their own propaganda-like messages that reflect the narratives of the disinformation operatives. Looking beyond a single campaign, the pervasive use of disinformation has consequences for society experiencing it. One of those is diminished trust in information. We've talked a lot about that here. Disinformation reduces our ability to know whom or what to trust, with the idea that when people don't know where to go for information they can trust, they lose their agency, their ability to take decisions based on knowledge of the world. And this loss of trust feeds into this final point. Disinformation undermines democratic societies. It destabilizes the common ground we need to stand on to govern ourselves. It undermines our shared reality. We lose trust in information, in the confidence that we know what we know, that things are as they seem. Notice the positioning of these orange clusters on the outside of these communities, helping to pull these com communities further apart. This is empirical, but also metaphorical. Disinformation tires at the social fabric, amplifying existing divisions. If the disinformation becomes too extreme, we can't come together to govern ourselves. Finally, and this is my little upbeat, and hopefully I've got 30 seconds left to give it, um, we're not going to solve this all at once with a new tool or a new law or a new dig digital literacy class. It's a hard problem, but that doesn't mean we need, to give it, we need to give up. In fact, that's the last thing we need to do. We're not going to solve it all at once, but we are going to solve it. We need to keep working to understand how disinformation works and why we're vulnerable. We need to work on communicating these understandings to audiences, both broad and specific. And we need to keep working to address the problems from all sides. This is a, this is a complex problem, and we've got to chip away at it from different places to break it apart. And we need to keep wor working to restore trust in all these systems because a free and democratic society requires it. Thank you.